Welcome to The Third Story. I'm your host, Leo Sidrin. This week, the world lost a great producer, and I lost a friend. Tommy LaPuma died Monday night. He was 80 years old. In fact, he celebrated his 80th birthday last summer in Cleveland, and I'm so happy that I had a chance to work on putting that birthday tribute concert together. You never know when it'll be the last time that you see someone, and now that I think of it, I think that was the last time I saw Tommy. Most everybody who had any dealing with Tommy, whenever you say his name, they get this look of happiness. He just made people feel so good, special, talented, important, significant, and from what I saw, people really wanted to please him. And not just in the studio. I mean, just in life, there was such a strong intention coming off of him, combined with a gentle humanity and an elegance mixed with a real edge, street edge. He loved to interact. He loved to hang. But certainly in the studio, he was the greatest. In the last few days, I've seen dozens of letters and posts and quotes from people who have their own individual stories of what Tommy meant to them. Overall, what I get is the sense that he somehow elevated everyone, but it was almost invisible the way he did it. Just by being asked to perform a task by Tommy, the bar was raised, and somehow he made you think that you could reach it. And somehow you did. And you did your best, better than you maybe knew that you could. At least in my case, that was how it was. He was also associated with quality. His work was the best. He had decades-long relationships with the great cats, Steve Gadd, Krista McBride, Joe Sample, Al Schmidt, Klaus Ogerman. He produced classic records for Barbara Streisand, George Benson, Al Jarreau, The Crusaders, Dr. John, Natalie Cole, Miles Davis, Michael Franks, Sir Paul McCartney, and Diana Krall, who he was working with almost up until the very end. His records managed to have it both ways. They were hip and sophisticated, And they were also often successful. We were like family. I knew him and his wife, Jill, and his daughters from the time I was born. He was really a friend of my dad's, and that friendship went back to the early 70s. In fact, the last few years, my dad had been working on a biography of Tommy, and the two of them spent a lot of time together talking about Tommy's whole life and career, going all the way back. There are hours and hours of tapes from those conversations, and today I want to play you a few short excerpts from those tapes. I had the chance to hang out and work with Tommy a bit, never as a player, although he was always complimentary and encouraging, but more as a kind of sideman to him. I hung with him in Cleveland. He came from Cleveland originally, and he had started to spend more time there, even endowing the Tommy LaPuma Center for the Creative Arts at the Tri-C Community College. In fact, I was first tasked with conducting some interviews with Tommy and his colleagues, both for his book and also for the college and then briefly for the Northern Ohio Italian Association, but that's another story. But one of the most significant experiences I had with him was on a trip we took to Cuba back in the fall of 2015. We spent a few months preparing for the trip with a group of folks who were trying to put together a project down there, and the phone would ring any time and there would be Tommy, ready to dive in. You knew when you heard his voice, when you saw his name, on the caller ID or when you heard his voice on the other end of the phone that it was going to be a great conversation. Leo, Tommy, hey man. I and you just had to dive in all the way. There was no halfway. If you were working with Tommy, you were in it with him and he was totally consumed by it. He had so much passion for what he did. And even at nearly 80 years old, he was hanging. He didn't miss a meeting, a show, or a beat. He put my 39-year-old ass to shame. And... There was lunch. If you were fortunate enough to get to have lunch with Tommy, you knew you'd really made it. As it happens, my dad was staying with us this week in New York on his way to Paris when Tommy passed away. We woke up the day after, as we lately seem to do, the day after an intense experience, and we recorded this brief conversation. Then we found some corresponding moments from the taped interviews with Tommy, and the result is a kind of tone poem, a sound painting in which Tommy himself joins us at moments, sometimes takes the reins, sometimes simply underlines the point. These are tapes that for the most part were not meant to be broadcast. They were recorded for the book, during car rides, in restaurants, on the phone. It shows a very intimate side to him. Everybody knows the eminence, but few people know how he got there, why music was so important to him, or why he had so much empathy for the artists he worked with. There's so much to tell. There's so many fantastic and illuminating stories. These particular stories talk about a time in his life that hasn't been talked about too much. His childhood in Cleveland, how the radio was his best friend, how music saved his life. 
and how being a barber got him to L.A. So before I play the piece, I guess I'd like to just say thank you, Tommy, for your generosity of spirit, for so much great music, and for your friendship. You are a a one-of-a-kind, and the world is a much better place because you are in it. We'll always have Havana. Leo, Tommy, hey, man, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, man, I'll talk to you soon. Hey, why don't you tell me about when you first met Tommy LaPuma? I first met Tommy LaPuma in a recording studio in Los Angeles in 1972. I had signed to Blue Thumb Records, but his partner, Bob Krasnow, had actually signed me. And I was out in Beverly Hills to meet these guys, and somehow I must have met Tommy at the office, and uh, I went down to this recording session he was doing. It was with Phil Upchurch, and it was Phil Upchurch's record called Darkness, Darkness, which is a fantastic record. And anyway, I went down to the session, and I was there listening, and it was all these great cats, and there was a B3 set up in the room, and nobody was playing it. At one point, Tommy came up to me, he said, man, you play organ, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, man, why don't you go in and, and play on this track? And that's literally how I met Tommy. He had, I don't know if he heard me, he certainly had never heard me play organ before. Uh, but that's when I met him in 72. That period, 1970 to 75, I mean, that was this like totally free ranging, free reign period in the record yeah. business, right? Well, certainly a blue thumb, yeah. The record business was kind of tightening up after the total insanities of the 60s when record companies had no idea what to do and they just threw money at, at bands, you know. By the 70s, uh, they were making money and they were starting to organize how they went about it. Uh, but Blue Thumb never tightened up. Krasnow and Tommy, and there was a guy named Sal Licata. They had this office in, in Beverly Hills on Cannon Drive. And you'd go up there and hang with them, and they'd sit around and just, it was a hang. They'd talk the most outrageous talk. Krasnow had this office, you know, with a big picture of Jimi Hendrix on the wall in a barber's chair, which I always thought was interesting. Later when I found out Tommy had been a barber, that Krasnow had a barber's chair in his office, which is like where the guest used to sit. You'd sit on the barber's chair. You think and, that was a kind of tribute to where Tommy came I from? don't think so, but it, it felt, in, in retrospect, it felt like, oh, cool. But, you know, Tommy was exactly who he was then. I mean, he was just this great, funny, hip, easygoing cat. Uh, you know, loved listening to music, a bebopper, but also a groove dog, a guy who uh, loved getting high, a guy who loved hanging with cats. I mean, it, it, those guys perfected the hang. They really did. What was your perception of the way he worked from a kind of insider and outsider point of view? Well, uh, at, at Blue Thumb, and this is like 72, 73, you know, we could spend $25,000, dollars $40,000 on a record. That was a lot of money back then. Yeah. Um, so a lot of experimenting went on in the studio. You know, there wasn't a lot of pre-production on those records uh, before you went in the room. You kind of went in the room and did it there. But, you know, later on, uh, when things tightened up, Tommy still had nothing but time in the, in the studio. If, if you were doing a record with Tommy, take your time, man. There is a subtext to doing that with Cats, which is what we're doing here is really important, and it's very important that we do it right, and if we have to run this down one more time to make sure that we know what we're doing, that's what we're supposed to do. That's not an imposition. That's why we're here. Uh, which basically says Tommy stood between musicians and the, and the rest of the world, mm -hmm. especially the business world. One of the reasons he was so important to all the great cats is because he was like a buffer mm -hmm. to, to the, the winds of monetization. Mm -hmm. And it carried over to everything he did, you know? I mean, his sense of humor was, you know, elevated in a way. He liked the, the hippest stuff. It wasn't trashy. There was nothing trashy about Tommy. There was an elegance to him, but in a very hip way. I mean, there was an elegance to Lenny Bruce, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was an elegance. He loved Lord Buckley, that kind of faux elegance. Mm -hmm. You know, Tommy was first-generation American. His father was Sicilian. Mm -hmm. And he's one of these cats who made, who personally made the transition from the old world to the new world, but was in touch enough with the old world 
to, to love that tradition and to love those people. And he told stories about sitting around in the backyard as a kid and listening to the old guys tell stories and drink grappa mm -hmm. and sing songs. And he said, you know, those songs, nobody wrote them down. Nobody knows those melodies. Those songs are lost. So he was in touch enough with the past to know that it can be lost. Mm -hmm. So I think in a lot of ways, what he was doing was documenting this, this new world. Yeah, and contributing to it and shaping it into a vision that he loved, you know? I mean, he, he had a romantic aesthetic. He had a very grooving aesthetic. He said that you knew it was going to work when his butt started shaking in the chair. That was kind of his that barometer. Said, yeah, that, that was said about him, but, yeah. uh, but it was certainly true enough. You know, Tommy would always work in the studio. He wouldn't work in the control room. Uh, well, at first he did, you know, when he was starting out. But as soon as he got any... Uh, experience, he realized that he wanted to sit out in the studio with the musicians and produce from out there. I think he was one of two guys who ever really did that because it's, you know, it, it's a lot easier to sit in a control room with an engineer and just kind of go, yeah, nice, take, do it again. But he was out there literally hanging with the guys in the section. He didn't want to be separated out. And what do you think that says? What message does that send to everybody involved? Well, that he, first of all, I think he was more comfortable as a musician, being a musician with the musicians. The reason I, d I do that is t t twofold, a a at least. One, there was something about the talk back that, and the glass that I would freeze when I, I just couldn't, because everything would go silent. You know, you'd say, well, what do you think? You know, and being there, you'd hit the button and everything would go silent. And it's, ah, ma, ma, ma. You know, I just couldn't convey what I wanted to convey through the glass. And I don't know what it was. We were working on something, and I, and I wanted to be closer to the musicians to explain what it was that I was talking about. So I asked the second, do me a favor. Bring, bring a chair and some earphones out into the room so I could sit in the room and, you know, in the, in the music stand so I could have the music in front of me. And uh, so I, I explained whatever I was going to explain, and then I started realizing, because then we, we just took a take, I said, well, man, I'm so much more comfortable in here because I could react immediately when something happens. I could, I'm just part of the room. Second of all, the music happens in the room. He wants to be where the music happens. Yeah. And, and I feel so much, it's so much easier for me to talk without having that glass between me. And it just became something that I, I do. I just feel more, even, listen, even if there's just one person in the room overdubbing something, like if we're putting something on a track that we've already done. I, I sit in the room. And third of all, Th there's another reason too. He never loved the business side. The business side went on in the control room. There's a lot of shit that goes on inside the studio. He was never comfortable. He didn't like the phone no, ringing. Like he, phones he, he, ringing, people talking. He wanted to, the music. He wanted to live uh, in the you music. You know, it's yeah. like, and these are all distractions. And I don't want any distractions. I mean, all I want to do is I just want my earphones on. I want to hear the music. So, you know, I think you can't talk about Tommy and his sensitivity and his journey and his experience without looking at what happened to him as a kid and how that affected his entire trajectory. I mean, for, you know, this story is legendary, but it bears repeating. He was born in Cleveland. He was a first-generation American. And just as he was coming of age, he had this accident that affected the rest of his life. Yeah, well, he had a staph infection that settled in his hip and... Uh, he was hit by a baseball? Is that what happened? Yeah, what he thinks happened was... Gone in the hospital. He had his tonsils out a few months before that, and he thinks maybe he picked up a staph infection. A staph germ had entered my body. While he was in the hospital, and then later he got hit by a line drive on a baseball field. Uh -huh. and I got hit with this hard ball. He believed that then the infection settled in his hip. I was playing shortstop, and the guy, hit, we were playing, you know, hard ball. And he hit a line drive, and the next thing I know, they were all standing around me in a circle. And I was like, out. And I suddenly, you know, woke up to see them all around me, and I, and I, my hip hurt, you know. And that was it. Like, you know, five minutes later, I shook it off, and I was back running and playing. And you know, maybe I don't know, a month later, a few months. I would complain about if I sat down and I would stand up, I'd have a hard time. I'd limp for a while. 
But then, you know, I complained to my mother, but then next thing you know, I was out running around. So, you know, there wasn't enough for her to feel like God, something was wrong. And within six months or maybe six weeks, I don't know. One day, man, I he just... He said he found himself up on the ceiling looking down at his body on the couch. I don't even remember how it started, but all I know is the next thing I know, I was floating on the ceiling in the corner of, of the ceiling of what was like our living room. And people were gathered around him. I heard people like sort of sounding like they were... Very worried about stressed him. Stressed or, you know, like there was a problem. I'm saying... And his memory was, he said, Man, I don't know what they were worried about. I felt great. And I like saw myself laying on the couch. As a matter of fact, that's as great as I've ever felt. But I never felt so fucking good in my life. And, you know, I think he would have admitted that his whole life he was trying to get back to that feeling of, of being out of his body and how great that felt. Uh, huh. But thought, it was pain, actually, that was driving he, him out He wasn't body. in pain. I had, like, 104 temperature. I was in a coma. He had this infection, yeah. and he was practically dying at that point, but it, it wasn't pain. I, uh, you know, just the body going into that disassociated state. In any case... That's when I started going down, down and finally had to go into the hospital. He wound up spending over three years in and out of hospitals in traction, not allowed for a while uh, to see anybody, to have his comic books. And it's a classic story. What he had was a portable radio, and at night he discovered rhythm and blues, and it saved his life. The radio man was my friend. <laughs> and that's how, you know, I was hearing, just if I turn in the dial, I found this R&B station. It was like I'd just found heaven or something. Because before that, it was like, you know, the blackest, and any music that I had heard at that point was the Mills Brothers, you know? He heard the old style music. It was, you know, before rock and roll. It was the early 40s. It, it was the real deal. Louis Jordan, I was, yeah, of course, Louis Jordan. And that sound. Even hearing some Nat Cole. Mm -hmm. You know, that sound saved him. And then later when he went back to school, he was two years behind his classmates. So he was completely isolated. And then suddenly they put me back into the real world. And that, truthfully, as much as whatever affects the illness and everything he had on me for three years, which was, you know, traumatic enough, but I was totally unaware and not ready for what it was going to be like when I went back into the real world. Hmm. Because what happened was, by this time, I, you know, because I was between 9 and 12, I was growing, but my mm -hmm. left leg didn't grow. This is a guy who really understood. I mean, he was in a lot, in and out of a lot of pain throughout this, absolutely. He understood dealing with pain and he understood being an outsider. When I went back to school, it was, I mean, kids are cruel, you know? Like, they would just look, they'd look at me and then talk. And, so I had all that shit I dealt with, you know? Okay, now as all of this shit's going on, I hated school. He, he had a teacher in sixth grade. He had a, a music teacher who encouraged him to play an instrument, and he discovered saxophone. And from that time on, he said that's all he thought about it. Music was constantly, not just a part of my life, a part of every, almost like every minute. If he was walking in the hallway and other kids would say hi to him or were talking about whatever, he was always just thinking music. From the minute I woke up to the minute I went to sleep. And then when I started back in school and I started playing. He was thinking of what he could play here, what he could do there, and he turned into a pretty good player. That's all I thought about. And then eventually, you know, he started gigging and he discovered Charlie Parker and stuff. But that experience, the experience of understanding what it's like to be a freak in the room, he, he said later on, that that's one of the reasons why he was able to deal with artists. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, who, who, whether it was Anita Baker or whoever it was, the, the artists Barbara can be, Streisand, artists, Miles Davis. Miles Davis. Art, artists can be difficult. Matter of fact, he said, he remembered Miles saying to him, you know, the first time I was in Paris, I finally f felt what it was like not to be, you know, the freak in the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so Tommy... Uh, understood that, that art comes from this, it, you know, uh, a little alienation is not a bad thing mm -hmm. when it comes to art. But he also, because he came from this immigrant family, this, this working class family, he started out as a barber. Yeah, his father uh, 
became a barber. His father came from Sicily, and <laughs> it's a great story. His father, well, it's too yeah. long, it's too long, <laughs> but. You know, his story is one that's unbelievable. To go from, when he was born in 1892, mm. he was working, he said, I was working <clears throat> like a man when I was five years old. He had a lying mind. Yeah. He would have to go alone with a donkey up to these bombs yeah. and they would mine. They had a, he had a lease apparently or something on a mine so, where they would uh, dig out the lime. And that's what they made the blocks of the town and some towns around there out of this lime. Yeah. And that's what he did. But he put all of his kids to work. My father said when he was six years old, he was tired of living. At one point, uh, Tommy dropped out of high school, and he was wanted to be a musician. He was probably about 16, and his father said, no, you'll be a barber, and sent him to barber school. Well, the barber school was actually right up above where this uh, record store was, and so his father would drop him off at the barber school, and he'd wait for his father to pull away, and he'd go spend the day in the record store. Uh, but he wound up a barber, and he wound up working for his father, and he hated it. He hated, hated, hated cutting hair. And, uh, you know, the barber shop was in a, a tough part of Cleveland. And because of the industry there, the steel industry, he said people would come in f straight from work at 6 o'clock. And he would have to cut their hair. And he said, and I would have to shave their neck. And I was literally shaving the grime off their neck. And all he wanted was a car, you know, and he got this beautiful car. It was a pink and black Ford Fairlane. And he said he'd come out of work and it would be covered with a half inch of soot. So I'd get there at like 8 o'clock in the morning and I'd be there until 6, 6, 30, 7 o'clock at night. When I'd come out at night, there'd be a, a, a like, soot like this on my car. You know, and people were living in the middle of it, you know? And he just hated being a barber and... So then, you know, he went on the road with a band and that didn't, didn't, of course, didn't work out. And he went back to being a barber. He had a shop in uh, the building where uh, downtown uh, in Playhouse Square where the radio, popular radio stations were, and Alan Freed's radio station. Mm -hmm. The building across the street had a radio station, WJW. WVRE was down 13th. WHK was up on 46th. Uh, WGAR was on 12th. So the record business, in a way, the, in, in those days, it was only record distributors that were in town. All these guys would come up to Tommy's Barbershop. I had a friend who got into, uh, worked for the DECA distribution uh, uh, network. And, uh, and he started bringing people up to the shop because all the radio stations were around. And he kept hitting on them, saying, man, you know, I want to get in your business. How do I get in your business? I found it very interesting. And they would all say to him, nah, you stay as a barber, man. <laughs> you, you got a good business. Don't come into the record business. And finally, somebody threw him a bone, and for $75 a week, he started opening boxes in a warehouse. So the, being a barber d directly led to him getting into the record business. Mm -hmm. I think that combination of having been sick young and then having been a barber when he really didn't want to gave him a sense of not having anything to lose. Later on, he held on so hard to the stuff that he cared about. He really fought because he had fought for his life and then he had fought for his livelihood before he even really got started. He talks about when he uh, got to Los Angeles for the first time. He got a job there as a promotion guy. And it was really hard, and he was on the outside, and he didn't know anybody, and he wasn't doing particularly well. This is in the very early 60s. And he talks about one day looking in the mirror and seeing himself and saying to himself, well, you can't go home, man. you got to make it here. There's no going back. And I think that, that was him all the way down the line. You can't go back. Mm -hmm. Man, that period of the late 60s, mid-late 60s, when he left Cleveland and he went out west, is the kind of un told part of his development, right? Because he had to catch up so much when he left Cleveland to become the sophisticated, cosmopolitan, cultivated cat that he became. And he sort of invented himself and educated himself in those first years. Totally. He says when he went to uh, Los Angeles for the first time, he had no sense of nothing. I might as well have been in some foreign land or planet because L.A. next to Cleveland was 
And I go there in the middle of the winter. I had my hat, I had a coat, you know, the whole thing. Well, everybody, the first thing, they, the place they took me, they picked me up from the airport, took me right to a Starlet's baseball game, right? So Tommy goes out there, and he becomes eventually a, a radio promo guy. He's promoting songs. And he goes to these radio stations, and at one radio station, there's a guy named Bobby Dale, and Bobby Dale changed Tommy's life. Bobby Dale was a DJ, but not just a DJ. He was kind of a polymath. He was like a a self-invented guy. And he loved literature, and he loved films, and he loved books, and he loved music, and he loved the opera, and he loved jazz, and he loved Little Richard. And Tommy fell under his spell. And through Bobby Dale, he got educated. He read the books. He saw the films. He understood that, yeah, Charlie Parker was a genius, but, you know, so was Little Richard. Huh. And the, the tide turned for Tommy as a professional with a song called Papa U Mau Mau uh, by the Rivingtons. Papa U Mau Mau, Papa U Mau Mau. Tommy had to promote that song, and he took it to Bobby Dale, and he said, Bobby and I were really good friends, but he wouldn't necessarily do many favors because, you mm-hmm. know, that's not the way it worked. You know, Bobby, if Bobby believed in a song, he would play it, <laughs> he said. And a couple of days later, he was sitting at home, and he got a call from somebody at, at work, I guess it was when he was working at Liberty or whatever. I got this call from Bob Scaff, who was the head of national promotion. Who said, are you listening to Bobby Dale's program? And Tommy said, no, why? And he said, uh, he said, turn it on. Are you listening to Camp WV? I said, no, I'm Actually, I'm listening to Carol Leo. She was out there playing this record. I just had it. He said, well, let me tell you something. And Bobby Dale... He said, Bobby Dale is playing... Was playing Papa U Mau Mau. Papa U Mau Mau. That was the record. Now, when I first brought that record over to, to KFWB, I mean, it was one of those things where people just said, well, <laughs> okay, we'll play, you know. We'll put this on the side and let's see what it looks like. You know, let's see where else it's going to get played and all that kind of shit. Right. All right. So the next thing you know, Bobby Dale had gotten the record and he played it like over three hours. He must have played it 25 times. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we got a brand new song here. <laughs> it's Papa Umama from the Rivingtons. And that that's how Tommy made his bones. Uh-huh. And The next day, the distributor came in for like 10,000 records. <laughs> And Bobby Dale was, uh, for example, friends with Phil Spector. Mm -hmm. And Tommy became tight with Phil Spector. Mm -hmm. And through Phil Spector, Tommy met uh, Lenny Bruce and Mm -hmm. a lot of great people. I mean, Mm. Tommy's main asset at that point was he loved to hang. Mm -hmm. And he loved having lunch. He loved taking guys out to lunch. When he was... uh, uh, Before he was in uh, a promo man, when he was... uh, in publishing, mm-hmm. he was in song publishing. He hated it because he couldn't take guys out to lunch. Once he was able, once he had a, a budget to take guys mm-hmm. out to lunch and hang, he he found his. He could make something happen. Well, that's so interesting because to this day, anybody who had any contact with him talks about lunch had or dinner, lunch. Have, yeah, the meal. And the hang, and that that was the well, great one his, reward. One of his favorite movies was My Dinner with Andre. Yeah. I, I actually went to see that movie with him, and I remember sitting there, and it just reminded me of my dinner with Tommy. Yeah. That's what dinner with Tommy was like. It would just go on and on. You'd talk about all sorts of everything, and it was just the best. That's all you really wanted to do, and if you had to go make a record in order to do it, you would. <laughs> okay. Why don't you talk about Tommy? You grew up with this cat. Yeah. What was that like? Tommy Lapuma has been in your life since you were born, more or less. Yeah. Uh, what's your earliest memory of him? My real vivid memory starts when he moved to New York. And, of course, I was hanging out with his kids, you know, so I have these memories of the feeling of that apartment, that first apartment, and seeing life through that family's eyes. You know, I saw them as part of of extended family. I didn't see him as Tommy LaPuma of the Eminence. I saw him as, you know, a kind of extension of my family in a way. When I was 12 and 13 and got to come and spend time Uh, at his house in Connecticut where he gave me the keys to his recording studio and said, go ahead, let me hear what you're going to write. And he always listened and he always talked to me about music the same way he was talking to anybody. I mean, I'm talking about a 12 and 13 and 14-year-old kid just coming on 
and he took it seriously. At least it made me feel like he took me seriously. I felt totally included in it. And I remember the first time he called me babe and I answered to it, you know, and it's like a rite of passage, man. It's like a kind of bar mitzvah the first time he calls you babe. In the last few years when he would ask me to help him with stuff or work with him or work for him or whatever it was to get to be part of the the scheming with him and the, the planning and the back and forth and getting to see how he really works. You know, it meant a lot to me that he that he saw me as a cat by the end. But man, I mean, if I'm being honest, I have a load of memories of a bunch of car rides with Tommy listening to music. And he's, we he, used to do that all the time. We, uh, whenever I'd go to visit him, you know, uh, we'd go for a ride, man. And <laughs> he loved the sound system in his cars. Yeah. And we'd just go cruise through the country and have the best. Yeah. That, you know, w- w- honestly, that's really what brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. The fact that that's, that's never going to be possible again. I'm never going to hear his voice. I'm never going to see that smile. But I'm never going to get that, sit in that car, sit in that passenger seat. Sitting in a passenger seat with Tommy, man. That, that was like, uh, it was kind of like the definition of acceptance, like mm-hmm. you say. It's, it's like feeling totally accepted. 